So everybody get a little little dot at the beginning of the sermon? What you, uh, Liz, did I give you one? Okay. So everybody's got the little dot. So a family was traveling from Ontario to BC, a trip that they had made before. But this time they decided we're going to do it on the Canadian side. They had decided to move with their brother to Delta, BC. They established living arrangements. They had jobs. They even had a school picked out for their son. Everything was planned. Double checked, triple checked, and everything was ready to set out and start now. They had a 26 foot truck with a trailer, which they loaded their vehicle on. And they pulled out on time from Ontario and started the travels. Scott and Todd would divide the driving. They made it all the way to Verdun, Manitoba when they pulled into a gas station. And as they pulled in, a similar truck pulled in, exactly the same size and also pulling a vehicle on a trailer. They made small talk with the people and they learned that they were Danny and his wife Mina and they were also traveling to BC. Goodbyes were said, and they parted ways. The closer they got to Calgary, Scott became more agitated and insisted that they had to stop at his old workplace. He had items that he left behind when he moved to Ontario, so he wanted to get these items. Well, this would put them off on schedule, but the family decided we'll stop and we'll let Scott get what he needed. When Scott got into the restaurant, he made small talk with the people inside. And all this noise and all this agitation seemed to be working up inside this restaurant. So Todd, he's sitting there going, I'm not feeling comfortable no more. I think I better collect my family because I just overheard them say, they're going to go out and rob our truck and take everything they could for the money that Scott owed them. Scott decided he's going to stay, though, and try to work this out with these people. So Scott went out to the truck first. He gathered his belongings, and he came back in. Todd gathered up his family and got into the truck, and they start driving away. They got a little bit further away and decided we're going to take a rest here now because we feel comfortable and we're far enough away from these people that nothing could happen to us. While resting a bit away from the situation, they realized that the money they had put aside was all gone. The money that they had for first and last month's rent, groceries, and bills for the month while they were getting established was completely taken. Scott robbed them, and he left them in the mountains of Calgary during November with nothing. They had just enough gas to make it to Merritt. So they started to decide, well, we'll at least make it to Merritt, you know. It's better than just sitting here, see where we can get. At least we're not in the open and in the dark. So they started. They ran out. They coasted into a trucker's rush spot where they finally just had to stop. They sat there and they thought out their options. They knew Friday morning Todd was going to get his final pay deposited into the bank, but they had a whole night and a day to wait. And right now, they're sitting totally in the dark in the middle of nowhere. A couple of big trucks drove into the rest spot and Todd tried to get their attention, but to no avail. Finally, a small flatbed tow truck pulled in. It made enough noise that it could have woken the dead. The loud exhaust, the rumbling. You could not miss this truck coming in. So Todd said, Serena, this time you try. I'm not doing any good, so we'll send out Serena, the pretty one, and see what happens now. So she gets out there, and the truck driver drop, jumps out. He's dirty, he's got long hair, he's rather unkempt. He doesn't look like a really nice guy. But he heard the story, and he said to Serena, well, I'm going to tell you and Todd to coast down the hill 
and there's a gas station on the right. Just pull in. So, by faith, they did exactly what he said. And the kind man named Michael met them at the gas station. Serena Todd and the little child, they walked into the gas station and they sat there and he said, okay, here's the money. This is what I could give you for gas. It should be enough to get you where you're going. Well, the gas attendant had overheard what was going on. And she said, hey, I got some drinks here and I got leftover food that's been sitting here for a while, but this could maybe help you at least feed you and keep you warm. So they thanked her and they took her name and address to let her know that yes, they did finally make it to where they're going. Both the gas attendant and Michael had given Todd directions on how to pass the Coquihalla Toll Highway. It's a very costly toll. For each axle, you pay 40 bucks. Well, without money, they're going to have to make sure they make it the other way down. While the conversation was going on and they were talking with the gas attendant, eating and drinking, Michael had slipped away. No one heard him leave. No one heard that lousy, noisy truck. The truck just seemed to disappear. Nobody heard the bells dingling when he walked out. So they were like, who is this Michael? He just kind of slipped out. They thanked the gas attendant and began the journeys again. Well, Todd and his Serena were in good spirits. They were talking away. And they just happened to make a right turn instead of the left. This right turn took them up into the mountains instead of going down to Vancouver. Well, this was day five of a three-day trip that now found themselves in. Once again, they were getting into Ashcroft, Canada. Now, if anybody knows where Ashcroft is, it's the only part of Canada that actually is considered the desert. When you're in this desert, they actually have tumbleweeds that apparently roll down the street. And that's where a lot of our movies, when you see desert movies, are filmed or up there in Ashcroft, Canada. Once again, running out of gas, they pulled into an abandoned parking lot. They only had to wait one more day, hungry, tired, unable to shower for five days. They sat and rested in the truck. Approaching a gas station just a block away, they went in and they spoke with Fern, the gas attendant. She allowed them to go into the washroom and get cleaned up. She gave them some drinks and whatever leftover food they had on the stand. They thanked her and went, into, went out to the truck and decided, we'll take a rest until the next day. As they were walking, did you get where you were going? A loud voice yelled out. They ignored it because, hey, nobody knows us. We're new to this town. And he yelled out two or three good times again and the finally... Todd decides I'm going to turn around and, hey, look, there's Danny from Verdun, Manitoba. They sat and explained to Danny what had happened, and they parted ways again. Later that evening, someone came up, and they were honking their car, and they were pounding on their truck, and Danny and Mina came to take the family for a hot meal. Todd and Serena had gotten their address and promised to pay them back. But Danny and Mina only wanted to know one thing. They got where they were going. So they left the restaurant and left Todd and Serena to sit just to enjoy themselves. But all of a sudden, Danny, a big guy, he comes walking back in and he's looking very tense and he takes Serena's hand and he puts something in it. And with a big smile and as big as the sun, he walked away again. He'd given Serena enough cash to last the next day over. They offered to pay Fern for exactly what they had ate, but she said, I want nothing of it. The only thing I want to know is you got where you were going. Well, they made it to where they were going, and they decided, hey, we're going to call and talk to Pete McMartin of the Vancouver Sun and let him know our story. So the story was told to him, and he had it just in time for Christmas, and he named it Angels Along the Way. The hospitality along the way of these people going out of the way to help and connect with strangers, this is the hospitality we read of so often in the Bible. 
we can even read about it at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, where Paul wrote, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For doing so, some people have had actually entertained angels without knowing it. The way we show hospitality is very important. For even Peter mentioned not to show it with grumbling or wishing we never did it. But our greatest example of hospitality is Jesus. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he sat with the poor, and he stayed with those that were also mourning. And he poured himself out until he was actually exhausted beyond. But Jesus came to serve the people, not to be served. Because serving is a way we ourselves can resemble Jesus day to day. But how can we be more hospitable? We already give. We help some people out. We help sometimes to the point of us ourselves being burnt out. Well, we heard today in the Bible text that the disciples became concerned about the people, asking for Jesus to send them away so they could find food. But Jesus turned to them and said, they do not need to go away. Feed them. The disciples once again needed faith. You all have one. The faith, the size of a mustard seed. We all know in Matthew 17, verse 20, that very familiar verse, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. That is the amount of faith that Jesus expects of each one of us. This size of a mustard seed is all we need. When you look at it, it also represents you and I in God's eyes. Yet we can have so much to give and not to be afraid. If we only believe, we can do it. A desperate woman reaches for the Jesus to touch his robe. Feel the mustard seed. Feel her faith that she had that Jesus could heal her if all she did was just touch that robe. Disciples tell the children to run along. Go, go, go. Jesus is too busy for you. Instead, Jesus calls them. Hey, come on over here. He sits with them. He possibly even gets down and plays with them. For, you know, children are our future. How do we continue on? How does this church continue without our children? Let them play. Let them sing. For hospitality is also meant for them. We look at someone and we see that by their outward appearance, they don't look like the type of person I really want to associate. We already got a preconceived idea of who they are. So we walk away from them and like, no, no, no. I'm not going to hang out with you. Jesus would have. He would have looked at them and said, I'm looking at their heart and seeing who the real person is, not the person that's being represented to you. Today, I forgot this over here. I often try to forget it. We receive so much media, social, social media notifications when we're outside of people, that we forget to look up. Look at the people that are around us. You go to a park, and what do you see? People down here and there. But yet the park's full of people, full of animals, full of flowers, things that you could be looking at daily. But we often bury ourselves. There's a person that could be sitting in that park that's wanted to give you their gift a gift of a smile, a gift of hospitality. And they're offering their mustard seed to you because they're having faith that you will not reject them, but actually stop and talk with them. Take the time that they need. Sometimes they need you more than you need them. But if we took the time, we find out that we actually needed each other. We have to stop seeing our feelings, our needs, or wants as greater than those that are out there 
For we're a community, and doing so, we grow emotionally and spiritually. Jesus said, feed them. How do we feed them? As we've been doing all along, as we must also invite them to come to our house, God's house. And two weeks ago, you invited every LGBTQIA plus plus two-spirit person to come to this church when you became affirming. You allowed me, my wife, to feel safe inside your doors because, hey, Mount Zion wants everyone to come and be with them. Who are them that I'm talking about? Well, I've already kind of covered that. Any new person that enters our doors. We have so much in common with each other as a community. We tend to forget that at one time, when we entered those doors and walked into this building, we were possibly frightened, apprehensive, unsure if we belong here. I know I was. How many people do you know walk in here with a tattoo on their forehead? I've been judged. I've been ridiculed. I've even felt left out because of my tattoo. What does it take, though, for somebody to ask me why I have it? And what does this tattoo mean to me? For it represents my love for my wife and the Druid Celtic way. But I know Jesus would have asked me. I have a mustard seed of faith to tell me he would have done so. Jesus, just as Jesus broke bread with the 5,000 or more, think of what we can do. Jesus had no home to invite people in because the planet, this earth, was his home. And wherever he went, he invited people to sit with him, to break bread with him, and to share with him. Jesus invited the people, those 5,000 people plus, because there's women and children that we don't know that were counted as well, he invited them to sit down, and then he took the bread, and he broke it, and he shared the bread with everyone. And then he took the fish, and he blessed the fish, and he shared the fish with everyone. He shared so much that the disciples became marveled at how much was left over. Twelve baskets fulls, plus. The disciples were also marveled at the fact of their... The, you got to remember, when they asked them, what are we to feed them? They didn't have the mustard seed. They forgot their faith that Jesus could still do miracles because Jesus does miracles daily. And it's just the mustard seed. But that's what Jesus used. Remember, when you came through these doors, someone met you. I know the first time I walked through these doors, it was Phil James. Big Phil James. He grabbed hold of my hand, and I think he shook me more than he shook my hand because I felt like I was lifting up and down. But at that moment, Phil gave me something I needed. Faith, again, that I was going to be okay here. I was going to be safe in these doors. And that's the same with each one of you. Somebody met you at the door, somebody shook your hand, somebody gave you a smile, a gift. They showed you hospitality just in that smile. Hospitality doesn't mean you always have to be given in every way. Sometimes a hug and a smile is all you need. Those people shared with you their mustard seed, their faith. On a side note, we're going to go back here for a minute. Pete McMartin, we all remember him from Vancouver Sun, he searched out everyone that was in that story because Todd and Serena took down those names and addresses and phone numbers. Pete was able to call them all up and ask them, well, can you confirm this part of the story? Oh, yes, we can. They actually confirmed the story. But one person he was unable to find. Can you guess who? He tried to call Michael's phone number. It was not in service. 
He actually went to Michael's address. It was an empty lot. He talked to the people on the street and he says, hey, yo, there was a guy named Michael. He lived here with a flatbed tow truck. Never heard of him. No such guy ever lived here. So he went to many of the neighbors and found nobody. Who was Michael? We may never know, but some have their very own ideas. And that's how Pete McMartin left it. He wasn't going to touch that side of the story anymore. Remember, the offer stands for everyone. Not just that those we deem that are deserving, but everyone. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 says, The spirit and the bride say, Come. Let the one who hears it answer, Come. Let the thirsty come forward. Let all those who desire accept the gift of life-giving water. Come. Come. 